It is my favorite chapter of the Bible. It's a famous story, Daniel in the Lion's Den, and it is, it's got everything. It's got everything in it. So if you have a Bible, um, can you turn there? Uh, and I'm going to invite Jordan to read just the first 11 verses. Um, and there's a hint for you. Because it is so good, we can only get through 11 verses. Is that much in there for us? It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom. With these administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel, the satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So the administrators and the satraps went as a group to the king and said, O King Darius, live forever. The royal administrators agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who portray, uh, who pay praise to any god or man during the next 30 days except you O king shall be thrown into the lion's den now O king issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of, of medes and the persians which cannot be repealed so king darius put the decree in writing now when daniel learned that the decree had been published he went to his home upstairs into his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Then Daniel, uh, then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. Amen. Fantastic verses, just the first 11 verses. Uh, and so we are going to get into it this morning. Uh, and I'm excited. I love this bit of scripture. It's got to be the bit of scripture I've read more than any other piece of scripture in the Bible. Love the story, love everything about it, and we're going to get into it. So, I've called this sermon, you've heard of C.S. Lewis, and he wrote the book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. This sermon is called The Lions, the Lawyers, and the Prophet. Okay? I don't think it's up there with C.S. Lewis, but it's not bad. Okay? Um... There's a famous saying about the law. There's a famous saying about the law, and it comes from Oliver Twist. And in there, in the, in the story of Oliver Twist, written by Charles Dickens, it, there's this statement. It says, the law is an ass. And it represents the law being stubborn, immovable, like a donkey. Okay, so we're talking about an animal. We're not talking about the American use of that word. Okay. And so as we look at these verses this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to look at Daniel, the prophet. We're going to look at his life. Then we're going to look at the lawyers later on. And then we're going to look at the lions probably next week. That'll be part two. Okay. So as we get into this chapter, let's have a quick recap. What's going on here? Daniel taken from his home, taken from his home, placed into a, a, an alien culture, and in this alien culture, he succeeds and he does exceptionally well. As we see in this particular chapter, Daniel is now ready to serve the third king. This is the third king that he's now serving. Okay. And this new king is setting up a new government and they're passing new laws. So verse one tells us about this new king. It says this in verse one, it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom. Now, a satrap would be like a governor. It would be like a, a counselor, that kind of person. Okay. So there's been a regime change. <clears throat> and Darius is a new man in charge. And what's happening here and what's different from the previous kings of Babylonian administration is that this king, he wants to rule by law rather than by brute force. The Babylonian Empire was all about brute force and power, and you will obey or you will die. This administration, 
Okay, they want to do things a little bit more fairer and they want laws in place. And it's kind of like an attempt to bring the country together with all these different parts. Uh, and, and in doing so, what they actually do is they end up sending some of the captives back to their homeland. That's what happens under this administration. And this was in direct opposition to the way the Babylonians had done things. They were taking people from their homelands and making them slaves and administrators in their kingdom. But even within these new laws, there's the same old problems, okay? Now, Daniel is approximately 80 years of age. He's an 80-year-old, and he's being asked to go to work. So there's a, a thought all on its own. What is that like? You know, how, how, would, you, how, how would you actually do that, okay? Um, in the previous chapter, he'd been given a stupid, super duper promotion, rather. And this promotion, you could tell by the way that he talked about it, he wasn't impressed. He says, you can keep your wealth to the king. You can keep your gold. I'll tell you what you want to know. However, despite the atrocities committed upon him, he never blames God. And that's one of the big things in this chapter that we need to get hold of and this idea of you know if things don't go you the way you want them to go if things aren't the way you like them to be you know at the start of the year you had a plan 2020 goals dreams ambitions and here we are in lockdown in our homes trapped what do you do when you are not able to have the opportunities that you thought you were going to have. Daniel is kidnapped against his will. He didn't get to go to the university of his choice, let alone have the right mobile phone. And he's got to eat vegetables. So eating his favorite comfort food, okay, is out of the question. And yet what we find in his prayer life Described in verse 10, and this is reading from the ESV, it says three times a day, he got down on his knees, he prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. And here's the thing I want you to get. He thanks God. Silence. He thanks God. Let's go back over what's happened to him. Kidnapped, castrated, didn't get to go to a university of his choice, has to eat food that he doesn't like has to be indoctrinated with things that he would find personally offensive. And what do we find? We find this man thanking his God. He thanks God for 70 years in Babylon. Do we have a lot to be thankful for? From the outside looking in, you might say no. His life was full of trials. His life was full of hardships. And yet he gives, thanks, he gives thanks for it. So here's point number one. There is always something to be thankful for. Thank God in the lockdown. Thank God that your garden probably has never looked this good. Thank God that, from the, <clears throat> thank God that your house has probably never been this cleaner. Thank God for your church family who are phoning you maybe or in contact with you. Thank God for technology that allows us to do this. Thank God for the sunshine and the great weather. If we hadn't had that, it would have been a lot harder, wouldn't it? But there's always something we can thank God for. And in this volatile world that Daniel lived in, Daniel was the recurring constant. He was a constant person in this story. Kingdoms came and kingdoms went. Kings set themselves up and they fell. But Daniel is the constant. He's outlasted two monarchs. He's still standing. And Babylon represents what we would now call Iraq. And the Medo-Persian Empire represents what we'd now call Iran. Not in, in exact geography, but more or less in, you know, sphere. King Nebuchadnezzar ruled for 40 years. And then after this, his son ruled for a shorter time. Amidst a lot of bloodletting and power grabbing, there's now a new sheriff in town, and he's called Cyrus. So Cyrus is the overall king, and Darius is like the local king, which is why he figures in this story. 
but against this backdrop of uncertainty, volatility, where a wrong decision could cost you your life, we find an 80-year-old man, an 80-year-old Daniel, still faithful to his God, still doing what he'd done before, regardless of policy changes, regardless of which way the wind blew with the new kings and the new kingdoms, a new king and a new administration could be chaotic, but in the midst of the, of the chaos, Daniel is constant. Serving the one true God who reigns over all. What a message for us today. Stay faithful to God. Second Timothy 2 verse 13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot disown himself. It takes faith to be faithful. God cannot be anything other than faithful, and he will keep your heart and mind in peace. In the midst of a chaotic world, the world is looking and counting on those who are calm, who are constant, and who are consistent like Daniel. So point number two, be calm, consistent, and constant, because the Lord your God is with you. As our story moves on, Daniel, Daniel's character comes under scrutiny. Daniel is Christ-like in this way as we see his character shine through this narrative. Verse 3 says this, Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. The ESV says that he so distinguished himself above all the high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was upon him. In the day and age in which we live, there is a huge amount of interest in good leadership. And it often boils down to character. Daniel had at least 60, maybe 70 years of service to a variety of different kings and kingdoms. And when he's examined across those 60 years, he's found to be faultless. Wow. He's found to be faultless. Most of us, if we were examined after around about 10 to 15 minutes, <laughs> we would find a fault, wouldn't we? There'd be something that people say, oh, there you go. There's your fault. And with his character comes competence, okay? So it says in our verse that he so distinguished himself. Daniel is good at what he does. In fact, he's more than good. He's described as exceptional at what he did. Um, and this really is a quality and a credit of what we see in, in his spirit. This word excellent, it literally means properly. It means what hangs over, what is abundant, more than enough. Anything that is great, anything that is preeminent, that's what's the description of what's going on inside Daniel through the power of the Holy Spirit. Daniel is filled with the Spirit of God, and his character is described to the Spirit which is a combination of good habits developed over the years and God's direct blessing on his life. Therefore, if you are saying that we're Christians and we're filled with the Spirit, then we must do things excellently. That's the message. In Christianity today, obviously excluding the, the family of DCC, I've experienced two types of Christians. Okay, the first type, or what we would call the spiritual type. They're great prayers, great devotional lives, and able to share their faith, but do not really test themselves within the field of work. They have skills and abilities that are often not used, and this is the group that I put myself in when I started out as a Christian. The second group, on closer inspection, do have skills, do have abilities. They attend church, but there's not a lot of depth to the faith. And there's uh, examples I always think of like politicians who are in, uh, who claim Christianity. I'm always a bit hesitant when they say they're a Christian for fear of what will come out of the mouths. What we see in Daniel 
is the Christ-like balance. When he has a problem, he prays. When the moment is right, he witnesses. When there is work to be done, he works and becomes skillful at what he does do. And all of this is repeatedly linked to his spirit. The distinguishing feature on every page of this book has been the spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit. And because of the spirit in him at 80 years old, at 80 he's described as exceptional, excellent, and extraordinary. So point number three, just because you're old does not mean you're done. Okay, now if we were in church, I would expect a hearty, yeah, fist pumping, amen. Some of you doing backflips. I'm exaggerating. I know we don't do backflips in our church. But that's, that's what I'm trying to get across to you. Just because you're old doesn't mean you're done. It's the spirit inside of you that's the important thing. That's the important thing. One of the most foolish things we do in our culture is obsess with youth. All things that are young. Everything that's young has got to be good. I remember as a, as a teacher in a secondary school, the amount of kids, so we used to have these things called ECMs, Every Child Matters, and every child would have to be interviewed, and you'd have to ask them how they're doing in all aspects of their life, whether it's the education, the personal life. Everything was, you know, up for grabs. And so we do these interviews and we go through these processes and the amount of 14 year olds and 15 year olds that had relational problems. That's all we ended up talking about. And, you know, I used to say to uh, some of them, say, look, just get your GCSEs done, focus on that. There's loads of time for relationships afterwards. I think that our youth obsession in this culture is wrong. We're looking at scripture here and we see a man who's 80 years old and he's still operational and he's still up for it and he's still on the front foot. What a lesson for us to learn. So point number four, number four but just because you are a young person and full of energy does not mean that you are wise and full of wisdom. Wise and wisdom come from old people in general. But there are exceptions. Our society that we live in says that you're 66 years old. Once you've got to your 66, which so might be even 67 now for some, um, then it's time to put you out to pasture. It's time for you to retire from your vocation. But to retire from your vocation does not mean that you retire from your devotion to God. God has a lesson for us to learn. And I don't want to use the term old people, but, you know, Anyone above my age will say, well, we'll class that as an old person. So where, wherever you're at, I mean, I'm only 21, so I don't know where that leaves the rest of you. For those of you that don't know, I'm a lot older than 21. 50-ish, um, 50 plus, in fact, is where I'm at at the moment. Just because you have a certain age, it doesn't mean to say that it's over. Ministry opportunities unique to you and your needs there are things that only you can do for God. What we should be doing on a Thursday night when we stand outside our houses and clap is honour people like Captain Tom Moore. Who's heard of Captain Tom Moore, the 99-year-old man who did a sponsored walk around his garden and he wanted to do 100 laps and his aim was to raise £1,000 and he ended up raising 14 million pounds. Wow. He deserves a clap. When he'd finished his walk, he said the following words. To all those people who are finding it difficult at the moment, the sun will shine again on you and the clouds will go away. Wow. A 99-year-old man walking around his garden raising 14 million pounds. And at the end of that, he's still got some energy to try and encourage the nation. Wow. As God's people, we honor old people and people of all ages. And what we see in this story is eight-year-old Daniel being called upon for his service to this new nation. And though he is old, he's still ready for action. He's still up for it. If you're filled with the spirit of God and faithful to God, 
then you can be helpful to any organization. Leaders are looking for people of character and consistency. Being filled with the Spirit is ultimately about being Christ-like under pressure. When under pressure, Daniel is found to bear fruit. Just like Galatians 5, Daniel has peace. Daniel has patience. He has goodness, faithfulness, self-control. The lawmakers, the politicians, are the ones that display what we call the fruit of the flesh. They are first and foremost liars. They are jealous of Daniel, leading to enmity and strife, rivalries, divisions, and envy. So now we're going to look at these lawyers. So despite the fact that Daniel is an outstanding individual, they think they can take him down. And they do so through writing laws, making and writing new policy. Verse 4 says this, Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no fault or complaint because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Daniel comes under intense scrutiny and the only fault I find is to do with his religion. In every other area, he's faultless. What a thing to say about a person in government. Wouldn't that be nice? Consider the options that we've got in our present parliament. Now, I'm not saying that everyone in the parliament is, is necessarily bad, but the ones that you see on TV, there's not a lot of choice in regards to character. Over the 70 years that this man, Daniel, has been in government, they could not find any dirt whatsoever, regardless of how much they dug. So point number one from this section is, it's possible to have good character in a bad world. That is possible. Now, because they cannot find any fault, they decide to impose a restriction on his religious beliefs. Does that sound familiar? Christians in the UK are being challenged about the public expression of their faith, sharing their faith on street evangelism, or standing up against ungodly practice, as was the case for the ashes when they refused to bake something. There is a regular and consistent infringement on the gospel. And guess what? It's not new. It goes back to Daniel's day. The critics gather and they find a loophole. This guy's got a weak spot and it's the law of his God. Four principles I think we can glean from these verses, okay? This move by these men is politically motivated and it does not have the best intentions for the people under their care. Genuine leadership is all about what is best for those under us. What's the best thing to do? The best thing to do would have been to leave Daniel alone and let him establish some of God's laws in that nation. Principle number two, when people are given power and they're not competent to lead, they try and do so through lawmaking. The more incompetent these people are, the more laws are needed. We see that often. We see that often in our own government. They're always passing a law for this, a law for that. We currently have some very stringent laws, and we're seeing all the time um, the police not sure where they stand. There was something I read just this morning. A policeman pulled a man over because he was taking, uh, he just bought a, a quad bike, and the policeman is recorded as saying, if you don't do what I'm, I'm telling you to do, then I'll arrest you. Who do you think they're going to believe? And now this guy is under some sort of discipline. When people who have no authority to lead try to do so, they always do so through dubious means. They set themselves up as a shadow government. And you see this all the time. You see it in companies, you see it in uh, government, and you see it in churches, obviously not our church, but it's people who are not qualified to lead trying to grab for power. It happens all the time. And the way that they do it is through group consensus. It says in verse 6, these administrators and the satraps went as a group. So what's going on? They've gone round and they've said, what do you think about this? You know, they sound someone out who's going to be favorable to their viewpoint. 
And then once you've got one, you get a few. And once you've got three or four, then you've got a little bit of momentum. And before you know it, all 120 of them as a group are on board with this plan. Typically, what's better, I always find, is find people who disagree with you. That's how you know whether you're on the right track or not, whether you can take somebody's disagreement. Because we live in a society at the moment where if you disagree with somebody, particularly in politics, you are castigated. And Christians, our role is peacemakers. Try and bring the sides together. Forgiving wrongs. That's what we're about. Daniel, however, he lives by a different law. It literally says we're not going to find a fault with him unless we find it in the law of his God. And so this law that he lives by is a, a higher law. And even though he lived by this way, these other people, they're making laws, but they're doing so with no reference to God. When that happens, which as we can see in our society, it's generally destructive. Verse 7 says this. The administrators and the advisors and the governors have agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree, put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, let's just sort of bring this home to our own sort of world. You know, you can't, either the king is, you know, he's in transition. He's trying to get some, so, some new laws intact. In, in he's trying to work out who his friends are, who his friends are. And so these people come along and, and they suggest, you know what, let's make, let's make a, um, a, a plan that, that you, for 30 days, you're going to be like God. Okay. Now, I'm not being funny, but the vast majority of us will probably, in that position, go along with it. 30 days. It's only 30 days. Be all right. Be okay. Doesn't really matter, does it? After that, everything goes back to normal. So you can't really um, blame Darius for this, you know, that he's fallen for a little bit of flattery, by all accounts, but he goes for it. And these politicians and lawyers, they tell him a lie. The king and all the administrators, all? Did all the administrators agree to pass this law? No. Daniel's not going to stand there and go, mm, I think that'll, that'll definitely uh, harm my chances. He's, he's not even involved in this at all. Now, point number two. Darius, who by all accounts is a good leader, makes a bad decision. So a little leadership point, a good leader can make a bad decision with wrong information, which is what he does. It would have been better for him to try and find that information out himself. Now, in the text, what we see is a law being written, and it clashes with God's law. How do we know that? Because the word law, edit, decree, writing, all those things, all that sort of lawyery stuff is written in his first few verses over and over and over again. It says here, in writing, so it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the means of the measures, which cannot be repealed. This law is trying to do and be what only God's law can be, be and do. They're in the process of setting up a new nation. They're writing laws to make things fairer, maybe bring some unity across the empire. But we know that there's only one law. There's only one law that is not repealed, and it is God's, God's book. We're told at the back of this book, God's book, that if we change anything in it, we're in trouble. We're told in Psalms 19 that this law, this thing here, is perfect. He says in Psalms 19 that the law of the Lord is perfect, revitalizing the soul. It brings life to your inner being. He says the judgments in here rejoice the heart. He says nothing compares to this law, this, this law. And so what's happening here 
is there is a set of people who think they know more than God, which is exactly where we are in our society. There's a set of people who think they can pass laws with no reference to God. And so where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us with the sure promises of the living God in our Bibles. When he says he'll never leave us nor forsake us, he's telling us the truth. When he says he'll intervene to help us, he's telling us the truth. When we pray to him and we've seen prayer answered, we know he's on our side. When he says that his word never comes back void, as I look out and see video screens of people's faces, and I can't really gauge where, you know, whether it's, you know, how people are reacting like you would normally do in church. I trust his word that he says it does not come back void. This word, this word, this law is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, it says. Cutting asunder the, uh, the, the flesh and the bone, it gets inside of us. It gets to grips with us and it can transform those that you would say are untransformable. God's word, God's law. That's where we go. When you hear laws being written, go to God's law. Find his promises and put your trust in those things. Point number three. If people choose to ignore God's law... Then they condemn innocent people to destruction and destructive people to ignorance. That's what we see in this story. The biblical picture for humanity is not to be conformed by human policy, but to be transformed by the power of God's word. And when God's word specifically clashes with government policy, then it's time for the Christians to make their stand. Many years ago, um, my uh, kids, when my kids were at um, primary school, there was a particular point where um, we needed to, or I needed to go in and talk to the primary school. The primary school was showing um, certain things in regards to sex education I felt was not appropriate for young kids. And so, you know, I, I phoned up the school and I decided to go in. And it's kind of like a bit of a nerve wracking one because I wasn't sure it was a Church of England school. I wasn't sure what kind of reception I was going to get. So I went in to see the head and I said, I don't think that the uh, stuff that you're showing these kids is appropriate for their age group. It's far too explicit and it is inappropriate. And the head of the school, she was a Christian and she was delighted that I complained. In fact, we almost became best mates instantly because she was waiting for someone to say that because they were a voluntary aided school and they could therefore say, we are not showing this information. Sometimes when the world encroaches with its policies and things are not um, you know, agreeable to what we understand God's word to be, then we need... Last thing I want to look at, the prophet and his prayer life. Verse 10. When Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home, upstairs to his room, where the windows were open towards Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Daniel's successors rattle people, and they want to get rid of him. And they try and attack his faith. And he's got options. Daniel's got options. Option number one, he could run away. Just get out of there. Option number two. He could, just for 30 days, join a new religion. Let's worship the king. Option number three. He could just go along with it and then go back home and pray to his God. So he did have options. And all these options are available. And Daniel does what Daniel had always been doing. He went and he found a place of prayer. And it was his first port of call. Often prayer, in my experience, is not always the first port of call. It's the second, the third, and sometimes the last. This distinguishing feature of Daniel's life 
is his prayer life. That's what distinct, that is what sets this guy apart. And as we read these verses, we're given insight into his day. Daniel had a job. He needed to be somewhere. He needed to take care of the king's accounts. And typically that would involve, in today's world, would be Excel spreadsheets and computers. Back in those days, it would have needed a team and probably a pretty big team. Daniel was brilliant at this. But no matter how busy his day was, he would always have three times in that day when he prayed. Wow. He's busy and he finds three times in his day when he can pray. And these times would typically be early in the morning before the day started, the middle of the day when he was hottest and people probably needed to take cover. And then the end of the day when the sun went down, whenever that was in Iraq. And through a busy schedule, he maintained this all the days of his life. So what can we learn? It says, first of all, that when he'd learned that the decree had been published, he went home and he goes to pray. He doesn't go and see his mates. doesn't go and get a latte. doesn't go to a local cake shop and have some comfort food. He goes to pray. Prayer was his first port of call. Secondly, Daniel created a good habit from a young age, and it's easy to establish good habits when younger rather than older. Third, he's not ashamed of his faith. He longed to see a new Jerusalem. It says that his windows were open, and it also says that he went upstairs. So in other words, he goes to his house, and I'm not sure whether he could literally see Jerusalem, but he knows which way it is. He opens his windows, and he has a vision that he's praying for. And what he's praying for is the restoration of Jerusalem. And it's the same for you and me. We pray for the restoration of our king, King Jesus, to come back. When you get up in the morning and you've got some time, or however long that time is, our look should be towards heaven, a heavenly Jerusalem which exists. And our prayer should be, our Father who art in heaven, your kingdom come, the new Jerusalem to come down. This vision that he had for the new Jerusalem energized him that he might see or he might hear about the restoration of his hometown. This vision was birthed in prayer and energized him through the years. This window that we said looked towards it. He had a vision, it was vibrant, and it made him do things. His faith, though private, attracted public attention. When the windows were open, the lawyers and the politicians, they came and they saw him doing what he always did. His faith was vibrant and there were times in his prayer life when he was flexible, where he had to pray a little bit more, even though he already looks like he's doing loads of praying. Now you might think, well, you know, my prayer life is something that I struggle with. And maybe with us being isolated, you might be finding it harder to pray. So, certain things that you can get into for a simple prayer life. First of all, get up and thank God. Thank God for what he's given you while you've got breath in your bones. Give him some praise. Point number two, pray for people that you know. Point number three, pray for this lockdown to end. Point number four, pray for people who you know are now enduring economic hardships. And list maybe two, three, four, or five things that you can pray for. I used to do what we call seven minutes with God. And I'd go through seven separate things that I would thank God for. And then at the end, I would thank God again. Now, if you struggle in that area and you want some resources, there's loads of resources that we can get to you in regards to prayer. We do have online prayer Zoom meetings that we've been having. We're going to have one tonight. So you're welcome to join us if you'd like. But as I come to the end of this message... We need to think about the simple things that Daniel did. First of all, he was faithful. It takes faith to be faithful. Second of all, because of his faith and his faithfulness, his prayer life sets him apart like none other. Thirdly, because of his age, his age was not a discriminating factor. He was 80, but he had fire in his bones. And fourthly, the vision that he had kept him going he wanted to see god build his kingdom just like you and me that's what keeps me going even though we're in lockdown even though i'm in the house even though that it is uh, it's a tough time 
I want to see God build his kingdom. I want to see the kingdom advance. I want to see it grow. And I know that if I pray those things, that God, who is faithful, will hear my prayer. be